Hey, I'm going to try this again. Okay, chapter seven, physical and chemical oceanography. Um, your test is not going to be on Monday. It's going to be on Thursday, um, the 31st. I think it's 31 days in January. It's the last day in January. My last day being 30. Vocab words, salinity, dissolution, solubility, biomagnification, hypersaline, dissolved oxygen, oxygen minimum layer, density, thermocline, halocline, tide, semi-diurnal, diurnal, tidal range, spring tides, neap tides, tidal surge, current, Coriolis effect, El Nino monsoon, tropical cyclone, hurricane, typhoon, latent heat, evaporation, precipitation. Um, so looking at the chemical composition of seawater, we're going to look at its salinity or its dissolved particles. Sorry. Um, it's not just salts, it's dissolved particles measured in parts per thousand or um, looks like a percent with another zero on it. Um, that's like a cent is out of a hundred, this is out of a thousand. So um, the typical salinity in the ocean is 35 um, parts per thousand. I'm going to show you how they can figure it out really quick. One second. Or not necessarily how they figure it out, but what that means to have 35 parts per thousand. Okay, so to explain 35 parts per thousand, let me just figure this out for you. Okay, um, so what that means is like, you know, if you did something out of a percent, you know that it's out of a hundred. So this is out of a thousand. So the way that we would measure this, um, we actually measure this in like grams per milliliter. So we measure density. Okay, so in here is a thousand milliliters. We'll pretend like it's ocean water. So a thousand milliliters or one liter, but it's out of a thousand. Milli means a thousandth. So there's a thousand, um, one thousandths in here. So it's one liter or one thousand milliliters. And if this was salt water um, and I evaporated out all of the water particles, right? I just um, I heated it up, moved it to its um, vaporization state. I would have 35 grams of salt left over. Um, and it's not just sodium and chlorine. Remember, it's all of those dissolved particles that you have on um, like this next slide. Yes. So I'll show you what that kind of looks like really quick. I have some salt. Um, you can see what I'm doing right here. Okay, so I have the scale with the weigh boat on it. We're going to tear it or zero it out so it doesn't take in consideration the weigh boat. And we're going to look at how much is 35? Right now we're about 24 and a half. Okay, it's actually 35.2, which is fine. So I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, so I'm done with this. If I were to evaporate out all of this salt water that I got from the ocean, um, I would be left with 35 grams of um, particles on average, on average. Um, you know, in the, tropic, in the tropics, at the surface, we would have um, definitely more salt than water because um, there's a high evaporation rate. Um, really depends. Is there fresh water being introduced? Is there a lot of runoff? Is there a lot of fresh water rich runoff? Is there salt water rich runoff? Is it by um, an area that does like salinization and there's a lot of brine? Um, so other things will change that. Um, was there a storm recently? Did it kick up a bunch of particulate matter that should be at the bottom? So here's pretty much the um, relationship there. This is parts per thousand. If this was a percent, right, and I measured... I had um, 100 milliliters of water, so this was filled up to the 100. If I had 100 milliliters of water, then I would have 3.5 grams of salt in there. This is 35 grams of salt, and this is 1,000 milliliters of water. But we don't measure it out of a percent. We measure it out of um, a percent per thousand. Okay. So that's really what salinity means. Which is all particles are in there. Um, and then how can we calculate the precise percentage? Um, so we can look at total dissolved solids. That's going to be like e like we just mentioned, evaporating out the water. Not good for using in the field, like on a boat, because you do have to, like, you know, 
have a fire <laughs> and or like run electronics not the best idea but you could also do electrical conductivity because we know salt is a conductor and it transfers electrons around um, you don't want to be in the ocean definitely when there's a storm um, or any sort of water but definitely not salt water um, it's a really good conductor so it, it it completes the current, if you will. Um, so electrical conductivity can be measured. All you'd really do is kind of like put an electrode um, between like, not an electrode, but like an electric current between two metal plates. Um, those plates are sitting in your water. The faster that current goes back and forth between those plates, the more salt particles are in there, um, the higher the salinity. Okay, and then the dissolved particles we have. Um, again, the theory of constant proportions I mentioned in class. No matter the amount of salt water you have, whether it's 100 milliliters or you have 600 milliliters or you have the big thousand, no matter what, if we dis if we evaporated out all of that water and just had the particles left, these would be the proportions that they're in. Um, chlorine would be there 55% of the time, or 55% of your particles would be chlorine. 50, um, 30 percent of your particles would be sodium. 7% would be sulfate and so on. So it's in no matter what, like the amount of water that you have, you could have a little bit or you could have a lot. If we evaporate it out, these are going to stay in the same proportions. Okay, so how can we change the concentration of dissolved particles or ions in our solution? And ions are just um, elements or atoms that have taken an electron or gave an electron. That's it. So it's just an atom with an unequal charge. Um, it can be through, and again, <clears throat> in classes where we talked about how, like what really influences the ocean. You can have things that are happening on land. You can have things or on land next to the ocean. You can have things that happen above the ocean in the atmosphere, and things that happen below the ocean um, at the bottom of the the ocean floor, where we're, you know there's a crack right open into the middle of the earth. So that would, like runoff would be your land. Volcanic eruptions would be under the ocean and also on land, and then um, atmospheric dissolution, obviously atmosphere. Okay, um, the effect of atmospheric dissolution on the composition of seawater, or the effect of how well the atmosphere can dissolve in the ocean, how that affects what the seawater is made of, because the atmosphere does influence it. Um, bell's gonna ring in one minute. This is Friday, so it's a little bit early. So atmospheric gases are always in a state of equilibrium. We talked about that in chapter four. Um, major atmospheric gases are gonna be nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. So the amount that's in the surface of the ocean or the amount that's in the ocean is gonna be relative, surface is going to be um, relatively at equilibrium to what's in the atmosphere. Things like to stay in a constant state of equilibrium. Um, if there's more carbon dioxide in the surface of the ocean, then it's gonna diffuse out into the atmosphere, vice versa. Um, except there is typically an oversaturation of gases at the surface because you have a lot of waves and a lot of mixing. All right. Um, the first 200 mil, uh, meters of water are going to have a lot of oxygen due to photosynthesis and uh, a lot of carbon dioxide, again, a lot of oxygen due to, um, due to the wave mixing. Okay, I just want to finish this slide before fourth period comes in. Um, two vocab words on here. We have dissolution um, or like how able um okay how able something is able to be dissolved so the dissolution um the dissolving of a solute into a solvent um so it's not their ability sorry it is, it is literally like a process dissolution it is a process of something happening anything ending in t-i-o-n is like a process or the action of so this is going to be something getting dissolved in something else salt getting dissolved in water um, salt would be the solute, water is the solvent. Solvent is doing the dissolving. Solubility is the ability to get dissolved. So salt has a high solubility. Um, carbon dioxide has a high solubility. Uh, nitrogen, low solubility because it is really well bonded to itself. Um, so what is going to control the amount of gases in seawater? There's four different factors. One is going to be how soluble the gas is. So like I just mentioned, carbon dioxide is super easy because it easily joins with water to make carbonate ions. Nitrogen is very hard. Um, nothing really is going to bond to nitrogen, like especially if it's um, nitrogen gas, N2. It's triple bonded to itself. That's why we need those diazotrophs to do nitrogen fixation um, so that nitrogen is put in a usable form. Oxygen, um, not also as soluble, um, but not as held together as your um, nitrogen. The temperature of the water, the colder the water is, the uh, more solubility it has, the easier it is to hold on to particles, gas particles. And the reason for that is the lack of kinetic energy. 
um, when things are, are warmer, if you shake something up like a soda, that's going to increase the kinetic energy of those particles and they're going to push the gas up because um, they're less dense. So it's going to push it up out of the solution. If it's colder, those particles are going slower. There's going to be less like pushing them towards the surface. Um, that's why a lot of our carbonated drinks are served cold. So the poles are going to have more oxygen than uh, even though they have a lack of photosynthesis, they are able to hold on to oxygen better. Um, the, not a lack of photosynthesis, but not as much, right? The salinity of water. Um, if there's more salt particles, so the higher the salinity, the less soluble the water is. Um, that's because there's not really enough space. There's more salt particles in there, so there's not going to be as much space to put in gas particles. Um, so a fresh water system would be able to hold on to temper or to hang on to gases and oxygen more than a salt water system because there are more dissolved particles in the salt water. It's just going to take up space. And then the last one is going to be the presence of organisms. So if you have um, a lot of consumers in there or if you have a really biodiverse area, you're going to have a lot of ca um, carbon dioxide being put in from respiration. Um, at the surface, you're not going to have so much of that because the plants are going to be taking in photos, uh, taking in carbon dioxide. Um, they're also going to be releasing a lot of oxygen because they're doing photosynthesis. So uh, there's some areas like your oxygen minimum zone where we're not going to have a lot of oxygen, but we do have some organisms who are adapted to live there. So um, that can determine it. All right, we'll get the next slide after fourth period. And then here's just a trend. As temperature increases, solubility goes down because kinetic energy is increasing. All right. Okay, I'm back. I'm just going to try and do like little bits here and there while I have some breaks throughout the day. Um, so other than how the atmosphere is, uh, atmosphere is affecting the chemical composition of seawater, um, so is things that are happening on land and things that are underneath. And so that could be like a volcano. Um, and we spent a couple days then looking at this, how the volcanoes affect the chemical composition of seawater. Um, they're going to release a lot of hot ash, um, a lot of uh, like volcanic ash that's acidic that could decrease the pH. Um, minerals into the atmosphere and into the water, those minerals are going to be magnesium, sulfur, and chlorine. Um, your gases are going to be mercury gas, um, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, and hydrochloric acid or hydrogen chloride. Okay. <laughs> It's easy memorization. Um, so those are going to go in the atmosphere, and they're also going to be put right into the ocean if that's an underwater volcano. But the ones that are in the atmosphere first are going to diffuse and then get dissolved within water droplets, condense, and then when it rains, it's going to be acidic. Um, and anything that's now stuck in that rain that came from the volcano is going back into the ground, whether to return to the water is runoff or if it's raining straight into your water source and it's going straight into your water source. Um, but don't think that every time it rains, it's going right into the ocean because runoff could be um, could be a possibility. Oh, stupid things. Um, the other one is the if, um, runoff. So if you're coming from land um, and, and, you know, we're not talking about the, the volcanoes anymore, just, you know, regular runoff. Um, Okay, um, so it's really just the flow of water from land back to um, back to river, tributaries, lakes, your ocean, whatever. Um, this runoff is coming from precipitation. So the water is going to run over the land and it's going to leach and like pick up and dissolve these smaller particles. Um, it could be fertilizers, it could be nutrients, it could be pesticides, it could be toxins, it could be oils, it could be medicine, whatever. And then it's going to take all of that back as long as they're like water soluble. Then it'll pick it up. Um, at low quantities, a lot of these things aren't a threat, but there are some um, that can biomagnify and build up levels in your food chain. Um, having too many fertilizers we know could cause algal blooms. So um, looking at biomagnification, I'm just going to give you an example. I know for some of you this was a little difficult last week. It is um, last Friday. You guys did biomagnification when I was getting my new car. <laughs> um, let me make this big. I'm going to flip it so that you don't see me backwards. Okay. I'm going to go to the board. Um, Biomagnification is kind of like a, just a basic um, bio concept. So normally we can dissolve things in our body and like urinate out the toxins. Um, if this was energy, like every trophic level is going to use up energy and you're not going to have as much as the one before you to be sent to the next trophic level. Um, try this. Okay. So this isn't going to be like a pyramid of energy um, or a pyramid of biomass. It's actually going to look like it's inverted. It's going to look like it's upside down. 
So I am um, actually going to draw this out one more time. I did it initially, and then... <laughs> okay. I'm going to get a new one. Nice. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So let's say I'm this super rich beach, beach um, homeowner and I live on the river, but I live beachside and I don't want to have any kind of pest on my lawn. Um, this was really popular and not really popular, but really started to become a problem environmentally um, when that we had a big crash. I think it was in the 50s or the 60s, a big crash in um, our bald eagle population. Looking back, we figured out, oh my gosh, it's literally from what we're putting on our crops and it's getting like biomagnified and building in toxins or it's also called bioaccumulation. So it's accumulating up our food chains and then killing our top predators. So an um, example I have, um, I'm a rich person and I definitely want to have really nice lawn and no pesticides and, um, and I don't care the effect it's going to have on the environment. All right. So I'm going to go. Let's say I am um, the producer, okay, it's my producer, and I'm going to talk in arbitrary units. Let's just say that I um, put one unit of, of uh, toxin on here, pesticide use. Okay, well, here, just a little plant, okay. These toxins, again, they get stuck in fat cells. And water um, does not dissolve fats or lipids. So if they're stuck in fat cells, they're going to stay in your fat cells unless you start just like losing fat cells. But these things are going to bioaccumulate. You don't have a way to get rid of them. Okay, they're like heavy metals. They like stay stuck in there. Well, um, all right, let's say there's a bunny and the bunny is going to eat the producer, but the bunny doesn't just eat one producer. Um, it eats a lot of these grasses. And let's just for the sake of numbers say that bunny eats 50 types of these grasses a year. So now my bunny is going to have, if each of these grasses has one arbitrary unit in there and it eats 50 a year, bun's going to have 50 arbitrary units of toxin in there. You can literally already see now it's starting to look inverted. It's not looking like this, like a pyramid of energy. The producer would have a lot of energy. Followed by my consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer. This would be like energy. It would also be like biomass, livable tissue. Cool. Um, well, let's say uh, your family cat goes outside and catches these little bunnies. And you're, you're okay with that because you're like, yeah, that's what cats do. You're not thinking that. What is that bunny eating? You haven't really thought about what the bunt has eaten. Um, you're just you're excited your cat's having a good time. Whatever. All right, so again, let's not assume that the bunny or the cat is only going to eat one bunny. Let's assume that the cat eats like 20 bunnies in the whole year. He eats 20 bunnies. Okay, and this is definitely not to scale because this is not 1 50th of this. It's not to scale. Um, all right, if my cat, cat, family cat, if my cat eats, 20 bunnies, then I'm looking at a thousand arbitrary units of this toxin now that originally started on my producer. And let's just finish it out. Let's say a hawk swoops down and eats the family cat. Oh. And this hawk is eating 10 family cats a year. Poor thing. All right. Much bigger. And obviously it's going to go past this area. Um, What did I say? He's 10? Okay. So 10,000 arbitrary units. The, first, the organism that's most affected by this is going to be your top trophic level um, because these are bioaccumulating. So that's what that means. Let's go to our next slide. I'm sure my screen's really big. Okay. Okay, 
Um, so the effects of evaporation and precipitation on salinity. Um, lower salinity doesn't happen because we are uh, taking out salts. We can't take out salts. You can just add or um, remove fresh water. Um, so the ways that this could happen, how do we add in fresh water? You could have fresh water runoff coming in um, or precipitation. And then you could also have melting of ice, sea ice. Um, estuaries have like a varied salinity. So at the mouth of the river, the freshwater river, they're going to have a lower salinity. And at the mouth of your um, uh, inlet, wherever it's connected to the ocean, you're going to have a higher salinity because you're going to have a lot of oceanic input. If something is classified as hypersaline, that means that it has a salinity level greater than 35 parts per thousand. Remember that 35 parts per thousand means that in a thousand milliliters of water, 35 grams of that is your dissolved particles. Um, what would cause this? Like a higher than average evaporation rate, um, low freshwater input, which could be like in the summer in your tropics, if it was an area that didn't have a lot of rain, but had a lot of evaporation happening. So sweet. And um, the Dead Sea is an example of this. It's so salty that um, you can float in there. And this is not ice. This is salt brine or salt buildup. Um, this would be an area that's definitely been experiencing high evaporation. So um, the salt particles are actually building up right here. Um, also looks like an area that could possibly have ice. Um, I don't, I'm not entirely sure. It's not, this isn't ice though. This is salt buildup, just brine. All right, let's talk about dissolved oxygen. Um, whether you were in class, whether we did it first and fourth period, we did it in class yesterday. We drew in our dissolved oxygen graph uh, today, Friday. The rest of you guys will do it fifth, sixth, and seventh. We'll draw in dissolved oxygen and hopefully the thermocline. Okay, um, so we need to know like why it's doing what it's doing at the top. So looking at dissolved oxygen, um, if salinity is high um, and if the temperature is high, we're going to have low oxygen in the water. Um, oxygen and salinity don't control each other, but they are controlled by similar things. They don't control each other. Okay, the salinity is high because there's a lot of evaporation because um, we're at the top, we're at the surface. Only water at the surface evaporates. If you're a foot below the surface, if you're three inches below the surface, no. If you are one inch below the surface, if you are one centimeter below the surface, the only thing on the surface that's going to evaporate is on the surface. Okay, and it's just water. Um, the temperature is high because you have thermal heating because it's close to the sun. All right. Now we know in warm temperatures, if we go all the way back to slide one, this is never easy to work. Not slide one. Um, we see right here the temperature of water, cold water holds gases better than warmer water. So at my surface where I'm warm, I'm not going to have as much dissolved oxygen, but I do because it's mixing and I'm in the photic zone. So with that relationship, we're like, well, there really shouldn't be a lot of oxygen, but we need to think about what processes are going on. The most amount of oxygen is in our top 100 meters of water, despite it being really warm. Um, and this is called supersaturation because it has a lot of, of gas in it. Um, this is from photosynthesis. So being in your photic zone and your producers, um, you know, creating organic molecules and releasing oxygen. Also because of waves. Um, obviously, if there's more waves and more turbulence in the water, it's going to be taking in more gases as those waves crash over. Um, as, so here we go. I'm at the top. But as depth increases, your oxygen is going to start to decrease until we hit this really weird like oxygen minimum layer. And if we see why, we have respiration happening. We don't have oxygen being produced anymore, so we don't have photosynthesis happening here. We have respiration happening and a little bit of decomposition. There's not a lot of organisms that are adapted to live in this layer because the oxygen is so low. They really can't do a lot of metabolic processes. So this is the layer of the ocean where the oxygen is lowest. It's between 100 and 1,000 meters deep, and that can vary because your oceans are always controlled by different things, different climates. Um, organisms here have to have like really, really special gills to be able to extract oxygen from the water. Um, they also have like a adapted form of hemoglobin that transports oxygen to their body 
They eat very rarely, like only a couple times a year because they don't have the oxygen to do metabol me metabolization. No? Metabolism. <laughs> okay. After your oxygen um, minimum layer, the concentration is going to begin to increase. And there's a reason why. So um, there's three reasons why. First of all, um, there's very little organisms that live here. So there's very little food resources. Um, if you wanted to eat, you couldn't. Um, that means that they're not going to have to, if they ate, they're going to have to now take an oxygen with it and break apart all of that organic material to give themselves ATP. Well, there's really nothing to eat, which is fine because there's no oxygen to be able to break that thing apart anyways. Um, so for that reason there, we don't have a lot of oxygens there. We don't have a lot, of, a lot of oxygens, a lot of organisms. We don't have a lot of respiration. So that's why we're going to have oxygen starting to pick up. We're not even using it. There's not any organisms there. The temperatures are starting to get really cold. And again, back from that original slide, how the atmosphere is going to change our chemical composition, um, cold water holds oxygen better. If you're forgetting that relationship or that doesn't make sense to you, you know, just on a test or whatever, think like, okay, I drink soda um, or anything that's carbonated. I drink it cold because it, it holds its gas content more. And that's all because of the kinetic energy of the particles. Um, as pressure increases, the solubility of water increases. It's able to like compact things and squeeze things together. Um, things that are compacted or things like you might buy that say um, keep out of reach of heat or keep away from heat, keep away from an open flame. Fire extinguishers, hairspray, um, you don't want those things to get hot because they are gaseous and they're under pressure, already a lot of pressure. And increasing the heat is going to increase the pressure and that thing could explode. But gases don't have a definite shape. They don't have a definite volume. Um, so we can compact them down easily. Okay, so that is our dissolved oxygen layer. Um, layers of the ocean. So um, what is really causing this layering? Um, the thermocline is going to be very much uh, involved with this. So um, we're looking at density here, uh, and we talk about density, fine. It's going to be your particles per area. The higher density, um, the lower it's going to be in your water column, or the deeper it's going to be if you have things that are, are very dense. Um, what's going to affect it? Temperature and salinity. Temperature affects it more than salinity, obviously, which is why in the tropics you might see really warm water with high evaporation that's also extremely salty, more salty than it is at the bottom of that sea. But the reason why it, we would expect really, really, really salty water at the surface to sink because it has more particles per area. But the temperature of the water is really warm because it's so close to the surface. That makes it less dense. So the high salinity makes it more dense. The temperature makes it less dense. And the temperature actually is like what's having more of a pool in that situation. And, uh, and, it, and that's why that water is going to float. So it's really warm, but it's also really salty. Um, I'm not sure. Remember, density is particles per area, so mass per unit volume. And we're looking at a thermocline, it's your boundary or the change in temperature, the um, drastic or big. Remember, we want to have those words, even though it's not right here. But on your on the mark schemes, they really like you to say big change or drastic change or greatest change um, of temperature with depth. Or you could say a boundary between two layers of water, but it needs to be like a drastic change. Um, why is the temperature doing this? Well, um, the water is going to be warm at the surface because of the sun, so it's not going to be as dense. Therefore, it's going to float. Thermocline is happening here. My sun penetration is decreasing. If we look where we're at, we're definitely at about 250, 200 meters, so out of our thermocline. Sun starts to decrease, 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 decrease. Sun penetration is going down. Therefore, my temperature is going down with depth. Okay, I get to about, I don't know, um, about 700, and there's no more addition of like thermo, um, like thermal radiation. And so it's just going to keep decreasing as we go further down. Um, definitely not touching this axis because that will mean it's freezing. And it's moving towards the left like this whole time. The Arctic has surface temperatures um, about 10. So there is that Cambridge question that says, um, on the graph, draw what you would expect the thermocline to look like in the Arctic. Um, one of the stipulations is that you're familiar with what the surface temperature would be. Uh, 24 degrees Celsius, I believe, is 
um, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So we would want to start here at about 10 for the surface in the Arctic. Um, it has a really small thermocline. Obviously, it's really cold. It doesn't have a lot of sun like heat influence. So your change in temperature isn't going to be as great because the temperature isn't that great anyway. Okay. Oh, and then we'll look at salinity, but I have to pause this and do my job. Hello, I'm back. Okay. Um, so talking about the halo cline, fourth period got to draw theirs in today. Um, the other classes will draw them in on Monday. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But this um, helps develop layers in the ocean. Um, just see what the slide was right before this. Temperature. Okay. And then dissolved oxygen. Okay. So we did the dissolved oxygen line in class. Everybody did. Um, some of you guys did the thermocline in class. And then layers of the ocean we will all do on um, Monday. And so, uh, the rest of you guys will do the thermocline as well. Okay. So, um... The, the halo cline is for salinity. And so like the water is going to present itself, um, you know, vertically in, in different columns based ultimately on density. Um, density is going to be controlled by salinity and temperature. And if we recap from the previous slide, um, we were talking about temperature affecting it. And now we're looking at salinity affecting it. Um, temperature is going to affect it more. And then fourth period, we discussed that today. Um, that even though you know there's so much evaporation in the tropics, um, leaving the surface layers with really high salinity, which would normally tell us, okay, it's going to be really dense, it should sink. Um, because there's so much like sun exposure, then the temperature gets really warm, and temper um, increasing temperature decreases salinity. So then you would think, well, then it's going to float because it's really warm. Um, so you know, what's stronger than the other, it's going to be temperature. Temperature um, decreases or increases density more than salinity does. Um, so definition here, your halo cline, just kind of like the thermocline, it's a layer of water, a boundary of water, where there's a great or a very big change in blah, blah, blah. So in this one, it's going to be where there's a rapid change in salinity with depth. Um, so looking at this graph here, it's a good one because it has both high latitudes, high latitudes think like 90 degrees or, you know, zero degrees, um, you know, across your uh, equator and then all the way up the poles to 90, you know, north and all the way up the, down the poles to 90 south. So your low latitudes are going to be like equatorial latitudes, <coughs> excuse me, um, 30 degrees uh, 30 degrees north and south, in between 30 degrees north and south. And then anything above that, obviously up to 90, is going to be your higher latitudes, um, difference being sun exposure. Okay, so um, just basic, we mentioned this in class many times, salinity increases, density is increasing because you're adding more salt particles per area. Not necessarily adding more salt particles, right? You're just taking away water. Um, more fresh water is going to sit on more salty water because it has less dissolved particles. Between the less saline, so your more fresh water, um, and less dense, otherwise less dense uh, surface waters, you're going to have more saline, more salty, and more dense bottom waters. Um, and that is going to be, there's going to be a halo climb, this boundary in between. I'm going to, oh no, oh, okay, hold on. I have an awesome picture, but it's not going to, turn it, turn it, turn it, okay. Um, I showed the halo cline in fourth period today, but in some cases you can like literally see um, what it, like the difference in salt, what it looks like. If I stop this right now, um, let's see. I know I updated it today at the end of the day. Oh, yep. Here it is. Ha <laughs> ha. The internet. Hashtag great 2019. Look at us. Victoria Velez. She's been on the notes all day. Good for her. Um, I, I'm going to just show this to you while I talk it to you. So, um, whoops, this guy is not standing up, right? He has bubbles coming up, which means he's in water. He is not standing. He is not standing. He is not diving. He is in, he's swimming right now. Right now he is swimming. And so somebody's taking his picture underwater. He's, um, in a cave and where I have this halo cline line, that's going to be this, you know, really deep gradient between 
very low concentration of salts to very high concentration of salts. I guess I should do it like this. No, I don't know. This, I don't know. I'm sure it's backwards for you. It's backwards for me. It doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> but they don't mix because the density gradient is so high or the salt gradient as well is so high. Um, temperature wise, I imagine it's pretty much a little bit of all the same. Um, a little bit of all the same because it doesn't seem like they're going to get much sun exposure at all. I'm pretty confident this is a cave. Uh, anyway, fresh water at the top and then very salty water at the bottom. So um, the halo cline is going to be right in this transition right here. Very fresh up here, this transition. It's my parents' dog. He's um, So you can see it there. Um, saltier water is going to be at the bottom, so it's going to sink. So then we should assume towards the bottom of the ocean, it's going to, as depth increases, inc you know, slightly. There's not going to be a huge, like, huge, um, you know, uh, I don't know, like increase in salt as, as we go down, it's going to gradually increase just like our dissolved oxygen does. Um, the only thing that doesn't follow this typical rule is, you know, our low latitudes being towards the equator. And the graphs that we're doing in class are actually um, equatorial graphs. So uh, it doesn't follow the norm. Um, but if, if it's helpful for you, we could totally add in like a, a dotted line of what that would look like at a high latitude or something. It would make it pretty crazy, um, but that would be it. Or we can just redo that one for graphs in a low la or a high latitude. Let me know. Let me know on Monday if you want to do that. And then I guess we can do that. Um, or I'll just like record myself doing it and then um, you guys can watch it and then do it at home if you want. So that would be doing the three graphs on a high latitude example. Um, so in the tropics, we're actually going to have higher rates of evaporation than anywhere else because of the sun exposure. Um, so there's going to, again, be a lot of salt left over, but the temperature is increasing so much because of sun exposure. So uh, a lot of salt makes you more dense. High temperature makes you less dense. And it's going to be temperature overall that's going to control that. So if we look at the halo cline graph here, I'm looking at low latitude, so the line on the right. Um, we're starting out really high at almost 37, almost 37 parts per thousand. Um, so that's definitely hypersaline, right? Our, our uh, typical or our average, we say, is about 35 parts per, per thousand, which means that in 1,000 milliliters of uh, salt water, 35 grams of that, and you know, go back to the earlier in the video, I showed you what that looked like. 35 grams of that is um, going to be dissolved particles. <clears throat> okay. High evaporation, um, high temperature, temperature trumps it. So it's going to stay less dense and float. And then as sun decreases, temperature decreases, um, we don't have, this does follow the halo cline as well. I'm sorry. That is the halo cline, thermal cline. Typically would follow the thermal cline, except again, the latitude situation. Um, your your uh, halo cline for your higher latitudes, your colder areas, does um, follow that of kind of like your thermal cline of what would be happening. So low salinity at the top, and then it gets more dense, so it's going to start to sink. Um, over here, high temperatures at the top, so it's less dense, and then it gets colder, so it starts to sink. Um, again, low latitudes. We're going to get higher in density and then sink, 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 sink. And what's keeping the salts floating right here? Like, why don't they just go straight down, right? We understand why they're going to float here. It's just so warm. But then once the sunlight goes away at about like 500 meters or so, um, that's not your photic zone necessarily. But it's like when the sunlight's going to go away um, and, and that warms, uh, you know, why doesn't it just all, drop all the way off? It doesn't because it has to, it floats in this less dense thermocline area. Thermocline is definitely going to help that stay floating. It doesn't really separate those boundaries. Because again, temperature is more like dominant over that. Okay, so how does mixing occur? Within the first 200 meters of the surface, mixing can occur. Winds, it, winds create waves. Literally, if I had like, uh, one sentence summary of college, um, the one thing that I, never leaves my head is winds make waves. Winds make waves. I don't know why, um, but that's that's it. And wind also creates currents, like global scale currents. 
anyways, um, it's not tides that make waves. Tides, you know, pull water out at the equatorial regions on our planet and then, you know, let water release. It's, it doesn't cause waves. It causes tides, the, the moon and the sun. Um, typically in your surface, because there is so much mixing in that 200 layer, uh, you're going to have a uniform temperature and uniform salinity. And all of our graphs in, in the ones we did in class, we saw this kind of pretty much like straight dip down because the turbulence does mix right there. Dissolved oxygen, but dissolved oxygen, um, yeah, all the way down to 200. Difference being there is just pe light penetration decreases, and we know that um, photosynthesis is a big contributor to that. Okay, density can cause mixing. They can stratify themselves or stack themselves based on their density gradients, right? Right here. So very less dense, very high density. So mixing can cause because of a density difference. Um, gosh, you know what? I don't... I don't remember exactly where this picture is. And I'll tell you what, this picture resurfaces all the time on the internet, um, claiming to be like in one C after another. I, I want to say it's like a C that, like a, I don't want to say Baltic Sea, but it could be. I'm uh, not really sure. Uh, it's like Arctic region, I want to say, if I remember correctly. But uh, here we see two different seas coming together. Um, or it could be a fresh water meeting a salty water. I'm not 110. Either way, high density, low density. You know, even with the dissolved particles, it looks darker. So um, if the surface water cools, so this is a way we can cause mixing. And maybe asterisk this. I know maybe it doesn't seem super important because it was like a tab over um, little bullet. But this is a question that I remember last year kids not thinking about. Um, kids, my students not thinking about. And, and I didn't really think about it either. But yeah, if your sur surface water cools, like if seasons change or if there's a cold front coming by, even though water has a high heat capacity, um, if your surface water cools, you know, it's losing its energy. It's going to become more dense and sink. Well, if it sinks, it's going to have to push something back up. Mixing is always good because you're getting, um, you know, nutrients mixed around and you're, and you're moving the water, which is oxygenating it. And that's good. But if, the, if something's going to sink, then something comes up above it. Um, but that is also, it, and that's going to be carrying nutrients too. Whatever is coming back up is going to be carrying nutrients. Remember nutrient sink. They typically stay within the, um, a little bit above the thermocline as well. So they, they do float a little bit. Remember that's why we mentioned the thermocline in chapter four. The nutrients are in without the first 200 layers. A lot of them do sink, but some of them do stay afloat because of that huge um, temperature gradient right there. The warm is going to stay above. <clears throat> Okay, so you got that last bullet. Don't forget that one. All right, um, I have to go pick up Olive, so I'm going to pick this up again um, just later. I'm hoping to have this done tonight, um, if not first thing, like tomorrow morning while she's sleeping. We got tides and storms and currents and El Nino and monsoons. Goodness gracious, oh my. All right. All right. Way back. Okay. All right. Um, so let's talk about the tides. Um, so there's going to be dictated or controlled by the moon and the sun. Um, and then depending on what phase the moon is in, um, it's going to have uh, a greater or less effect. Um, okay. So your definition, it's periodic, right? Because it depends on our, our lunar cycle. Periodic rise and fall of the surface of the ocean. Um, and it's caused by the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun. You can see tides occurring in all coastal areas, <clears throat> even in really large lakes. Um, I say large lakes because you're not going to see, you know, like everything has a gravitational pull. If you have a small body of water, that gravitational pull on it is also going to be pretty small. Um, so most coastal areas are going to have tides every 12 and a half hours. Um, just because of the rising of the sun, setting of the sun, and then rising of the moon, setting of the moon. Um, so if it's occurring every two, 12 and a half hours, then it's going to be occurring twice a day. So we call that semi-diurnal tides that occur twice a day. You're going to have two highs and two lows. Um, your lows are going to be when the sun is out and when the moon is out at its highest. And then in between that, you're going to have tides coming in and out, depending on what is happening. Um, your high tides are going to be when the sun is setting or the moon is starting to set. 
Um, so like that, like in between time and that's, you know, as it goes away, it's going to like release that water back to the earth and not have as strong as a pool. And so the tide's going to come up and be higher. The water will be higher. Um, you probably notice this, um, if you stay at the beach, you know, maybe till five o'clock or six o'clock or, um, you start to be like, oh, I have to move my towel back. I'd move my chair back. Um, the sun is setting. It's not having such a great pool on the water. So it's almost like releasing that water back. And then I guess our stuff wet. Okay, so we know tie is die is um two. So um semi-diurnal is two highs and two lows. Now just diurnal is gonna be the tide is occurring once a day. You're gonna have one high and one low. So diurnal is two, one high, one low. Semi-diurnal, two and two. The Gulf of Mexico is gonna be like this, having one high and one low tide. Um, tidal range is also called amplitude, um, or like the height. Amplitude is height. Amplitude is also volume. If we were talking about um, like sound waves, but your tidal range or tidal amplitude is going to be the difference or subtraction, some takeaways between your high and your low tides. Or your yeah. Um, it's going to vary day to day um, because the gravitational pull and the sun are different. Um, are, are you know they're not always the same. And we, moon is going through a lunar cycle. We also have seasons, so we have different times that we're away from the sun um, or closer to. It also depends on coastline features. Okay, um, so you can see here in the Gulf of Mexico, a little bit here towards the north and in your polar regions, um, we're only having that diurnal tide. The Gulf of Mexico is pretty small. Okay, so diurnal. We can see sun is starting to rise and it's pooling, 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 pooling. Um, and then the uh, sun is starting to set and then it's gonna, um, here we go, 12 hours. So it might be about like noon. Um, and then the sun is gonna start to set. Over here, we, this is what we're used to over here, the one on the right in Florida. So at the, um, sorry, I'm just starting to think, midnight, 12. 12 to midnight. Okay. Um, tide is high because we are having, um, you know, that biggest water pool. And then as it starts to set, it's releasing that water back down. Um, so you can see the height of the tide is changing. This is in meters um, with the sun and lunar phases. Okay. I just want to reiterate, I don't know if I said something conflicting between this slide and the last slide, I feel like I did. Um, the low tide is gonna be when you don't witness like um, a tidal bulge, like planetary, like here's earth. And if there's a tidal bulge, you can literally see in space, it's like pulling the water out from the sides. So low tides, you're not gonna witness that. Um, it's like the water is like released back to shore and you, this will be happening when um moon or sun are setting mainly it's going to be like our moon um but whenever it's coming back out it's all that gravity we're way closer to the moon than we are to the sun so that's why the the moon has like a big gravitational force or gravit um like tidal force or tidal pull on it um Yes. <laughs> and just because we're experiencing a low tide, that means somewhere on the other side of the world, they're going to be experiencing like a high tide and vice versa. So low tides are going to be when like the water comes back towards you and high tide is going to be when it's pulled out. Okay. Here's just an example of seeing tidal ranges um, for like a week. And this is from last year, this week of last year. Um, two different kinds. So we have spring tides and neap tides. Spring tides, think like boing, like something that's big. This is going to be your big, um, your big tidal surge. Um, it has nothing to do with the spring. Um, it happens uh, twice a month. So it has nothing to do with the spring. Um, this is going to create the greatest tidal range, like the greatest difference between your high and your lows. This is going to occur when the sun and the moon are aligned. It's going to cause your greatest tidal pull. So um, here we are. Here's the sun. Here's the moon. Um, obviously, when the moon is on this side, we have it's like a tug of war. You have the sun pooling and you have the moon pooling. Yeah, the sun is so much bigger than the moon, but the distance is actually what's really um, causing some some great effects here. How close we are to the to the moon. So um, when they're aligned, we're gonna have the biggest tidal pull um, towards the right. When they're aligned um, opposite each other, then uh, we're gonna have pulls out back. You know, if this is our Earth, we're gonna 
almost like pull it to both sides. Um, it's going to be dependent on the phase of the moon. It occurs during a new moon and then a full moon. So new moon, we don't see it because we don't see the sun shining on it. The sun is going to be behind it. Um, full moon, sun is shining on it. <clears throat> so we see it. It's going to occur twice a month um, because of that new moon and the full moon. Um, when the moon and the earth are on the same side again, you have your biggest, biggest tidal range. Um, I believe it's called a king tide, K-I-N-G, king tide. I'll have to look that up, though. Let me just pause it, and I will. Okay, in our currents, um, there's going to be two major different types of currents that we're going to look at. We're going to look at currents that are occurring on the surface. Um, and all currents are, it's just like a con continuous, so like current, it is happening currently, a continuous movement of um, water, and it's going to be caused by wind, either pushing it one way or another, or density. And if we go all the way back... We see here what affects density is temperature and salinity. So what could affect our currents is going to be things that can change our density, which would be a temperature change, so seasonal changes or weather happening, um, climate change, or things that affect our density, which would be the addition of fresh water or the addition of dissolved particles that could affect our density. And so that affects our currents. Oops. Okay. Um, currents are beneficial because they're going to bring um, nutrients and, you know, all the different nutrients you need to know for chapter four. Um, gases, so carbon dioxide, moving that around for plants, and then oxygen for all of your organisms doing respiration. Um, many organisms will use the currents to naturally take them from place to place. Um, but, and currents are created from wind, the Coriolis effect, so the movement or the spinning of the earth excuse me, spinning of the earth, and again, in the northern hemisphere, it moves water towards the right. And if I look right here, it's northern hemisphere. So if my water was naturally, if we look here, it says direction of air. Um, so if I have wind going towards the north in the northern hemisphere, you can see it going up towards the north. In the northern hemisphere, things get deflected towards the right. So the water is actually going to spin this way. Okay, and it shows you here where the deflected path is. Um, if we are in the northern hemisphere and we're going south, again, we're deflected to the right. So it's actually going to go towards the left and then vice versa in the southern hemisphere. Things are deflected towards the left. Um, this is what causes toilets to spin different ways, whether you're in the southern hemisphere or northern hemisphere. <clears throat> Temperature is going to um, control this. Salinity is going to control this. And then tides will also control this. So we have surface currents and deep water currents. Surface currents are going to be typically driven by wind. Um, the surface winds are like actually really dependable because they are based on like global wind patterns and like local climate situations and global climate situations. Um, wind is caused by unequal heating of the earth because the sun does not shine everywhere at the same time. We know that the earth is not, you know, it's like tilted on its axis. Um, so we have unequal heating. Well, we know that when things get warm, they get less dense, they can start to rise. When things get colder, they get more dense and will start to sink. And that's going to cause this air moving one way or another, like globally, globally. Every time I think like, oh, not every time, but when there's a lot of wind happening here, I'm like, okay, this is, you know, it's, it's planetary. This is happening because, you know, things move from a high concentration to a low concentration, Maybe we're just a little bit too warm and our water is, or our air is moving up. And so winds are coming to take that place. Anyway, areas with high solar radiation have a lot of excess heat in their air. And it's, again, it's going to cause it to rise. It's less dense and it'll sink. Areas with low solar radiation are going to have cooler temps. And um, those temperatures are actually going to try and like spread out to areas where it's, where it's a little bit warmer. But it's predictable. 
Um, and it gives us pretty constant sea surface temperatures with latitude, you know, with, with height of your planet. In the norm norm northern hemisphere, your currents are going to have a clockwise spin, so towards the right, the way that the clock would go. Southern hemisphere, towards the left, the opposite way a clock would go, so going from 12, 11, 10, 9. <clears throat> okay, let's, I underline these, so they must be super important. Surface current movement is due to the Coriolis effect, and the Coriolis effect is caused from the spinning of the Earth. Instead of traveling in a straight line of the Earth, the er objects or the currents will deflect to the um, right if they're in the normal northern hemisphere or the left if they're in the southern hemisphere. Um, and as wind blows water across the ocean, the rotation of the earth will cause it to deflect to a 45 degree angle. And you can see that here, a 90 degree, if I'm looking at this one, a 90, get the laser pointer out right here, um, a 90 degree angle would cause it to go this direction, but it's 45, so it's like kind of like cut in half. Um, this is why wind and water currents have this spiral pattern. It's not, uh, uh, it's not just towards one direction. It's it's not going straight 90 degrees the other direction. It is constantly going to keep going 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, and it'll cause it to spin. Watch these three videos. Let me pause it real quick, and I will come right back. Okay. Um, for those of you who have taken oceanography at Eastern Florida, I imagine you guys have spoken about the thermohaline circulation, um, you know, the, the actual current, the uh, deep water current that's going to move water globally under underneath. Um, so it's really going to start at the North Pole. Um, luckily here, I haven't, I know this is not super easy uh, to follow all the time. It will be, you know, the longer you listen to me talk about it or go through it on your own or, you know, watch videos about it or just walk your brain through this. Um, I don't recall many um, questions about thermohaline circulation, but anyway, um, so it's going to start at the North Pole. So I'm going to go up here by North America where water is going to freeze, it gets really cold. And we know that only freshwater freezes. So it's going to leave a lot of salt behind and leaving that salt behind. Not only is that water now really cold, increases density, and it is leaving salt behind because only fresh water freezes. So now we have a lot of salts, increases density. It's going to cause that water to sink. So denser water is going to down well, down. So opposite of up well, it's going to go down because of the density. Uh, it's going to mix with your water column until it hits the bottom. Okay, so I'm down right here. The water uh, moves south through the Atlantic towards the Antarctic. In the Antarctic, hold on, I'm going to put on a pointer. Okay, so I'm down here. In the Antarctic, um, the water's going to get colder and then it's going to split. So it's going to hit this fork in the road right here. It's either going to start going up the west coast of Africa or stay at the South Pole region. The current is going to go toward the equator, bringing nutrients to the African east coast. Um, then the water will begin to warm as it nears the equator, become less dense, rise to the surface. And when that water is near there, it's going to loop back through, move back up. Okay. So there it's coming back up. It's following this. And, and what's causing the surf, this is a surface flow now is that water came back up because it's so much warmer because it was less dense. It ro it rose. Now we're at a surface current. And now these are going to be moved based on global wind patterns. If the current stays at the bottom, so subsurface flow, um, it's going to continue to go over to your Pacific Ocean, past um, New Zealand, and it's going to move up and again near our equator, get warm, and warm things rise because they're less dense. And then as it rises, it's going to go back to our surface. And uh, that's really good too because we're anywhere it's rising, um, is going to be a lot of like, um, a lot of nutrients coming up, a lot of dissolved oxygen coming up because that water was originally at the bottom. Um, and it's, gonna, it's just going to bring up a lot of nutrients, a lot of gases, and it'll be good for all the organisms. All right. Um, again, this warm water current comes up because it gets closer to the equator. Um, and it's, and it's not as dense because it's warmer and it's gonna follow this top surface flow, and this surface flow is occurring again because of your global wind patterns. All right, our El Nino situation. I just realized I skipped the upwelling slide. 
Um, you guys know this by heart. The movement of cold nutrients water from the deep ocean to the surface. And it moves nutrients up. And why is it caused? It's caused by offshore winds pushing the water away from the shore. And if that water is moving back, then we're going to have this area of low pressure and like this gap almost where water needs to come up. And it's going to be cooler nutrient-rich water that's going to come up and take it. And downwelling would just be the opposite. If we had a wind pushing water towards the shore, that water is going to get like buried and pushed underneath. And then water is going to come up and take its place um, further back. All right, our El Nino conditions. So this doesn't occur um, on the East Coast, so we don't typically see it too much. Um, if you can see where we're looking at, it's really occurring like along Peru in South America. So you have, um, you know, currents flowing along this northern coast of Peru in South America, like on the West Coast of it. Um, and it's going to bring cold, like really cold nutrient-rich wa nutrient water towards the equator. And see like right here but this isn't just this tiny little area that it's falling right in south america's over here this isn't just the area that it's falling it's bringing all this nutrient-rich water like towards this whole like oceanic basin a little bit how do i skip that one Over. moving on okay um southern so below the equator, southern westerly winds, so pushing it towards the west, towards the west, will blow this warm water towards Asia and towards Australia. Um, and that's good because as this warm water gets pushed, cold water has to come up and take its place. So it's this like global wind pattern, pushing, 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 pushing this water away. Cold water is going to come up and take it. Um, that's really good because it's going to allow a lot of food. Um, we also see whales following this pattern going down here to breed and um, over by Hawaii to have their babies because it is a high productivity area. Um, now, this water that gets pushed towards the west, towards um, Asia and towards Australia, because it's warmer, that water can a little like expand a little bit. But plus, these winds are pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. It's like piling on top of each other. You actually see about a half meter higher water level um, in Asia and like the West Pacific than you do over in South America. But this warm water over here um, causes a lot of water to evaporate, and it's going to cause heavy rains over in the um, like Australia, Australian Pacific area, and in your Asian area, which is good. And also in Indonesia, which are all these little countries right here that have horrible um, tsunamis and earthquakes because they're all in fault lines because this whole area is a subduction zone. But anyways... Um, they get a lot of rain, and that's good because normally they would have really dry seasons, but this causes the Pacific to stay dry because all this warmness we're pushing over. Okay, so it occurs about every five years. Again, check out the video. Listen to somebody that is better than me explain this to you. So check out the video. Um, when it has like a southern oscillation, to, so to oscillate means like to change. It's going to occur every three to five years. Um, trade winds occur around the equator. They're called trade winds because they would send sailors like in the path of like trading. They go across the equator. So trade winds around the equator are going to like reduce or slow down. Remember, our winds are only happening because of unequal heating. So because of that warm and cold difference, well, if this is slowing down, that's going to be there's not too much unequal heating going on. It's not the lack of sun exposure. It's really the addition of greenhouse gases, but whatever. Um, so instead of that unequal heating, we don't have these westerly winds pushing. We, there's not that need because there is not that big of a, a temperature gradient difference. So warm water now instead, is, it's going to go the opposite direction. Those winds are going to blow the opposite direction. Um, and, and they're not actually going to be that like fierce pushing towards the west. Okay. Um, what you experience when this is happening is a warmer winter, like in, in our country. You're going to have a little bit of warmer winter. We won't necessarily realize it because it's going to be warm all the time. Um, but this warm water now is going to build over the coast of South America. So we're not getting that push towards the west anymore. We're going towards the right. Now, this isn't good because we're hoping for this, you know, the previous slide, we're hoping for this to be pushed towards the um, Pacific region, the, um, you know, Asia Pacific and Australian Pacific region, because that's going to cause upwelling on the coast of South America. 
we notice here is upwelling is not going to be occurring anymore um, because we're not having a loss of water there. We're actually having water being pushed towards them, warm water being pushed towards them. It's going to be pretty poor for South America because they're going to be benef They're going to be hoping that they have that extra nutrients um, to influence their fish catches and influence um, you know the biomass that they're able to have and the food that they're able to have. So that really affects their livelihoods, whether they're making money off of it or they're feeding their families from it. Um, and then not only that, we're going to have a lot of, you know, warmer weather situations, um, lots of rainfall over here, which isn't good because this is a very mountainous region. You can have a lot of landslides, a lot of rock falls. Um, it really liquefies the soil when that should actually be um, like a more arid region at that time. Um, over here. So if I go back to the other slide, this warm water in Australia and in Indonesia was causing a lot of evaporation, a lot of precipitation. Well, now that evaporation and precipitation is over at Peru, and we're going to have heavy droughts in Indonesia, Asia, and um, Australia. And then heavy fish declines over in South America because of that lack of upwelling. Okay, so talking about monsoons, um, monsoons are seasonal winds, so it's based on seasons, um, that happen in India. And this is because of the Indian Ocean. Um, Asia is huge, so it has a lot of different biomes, but this is just one of the climate biomes that they have. So this is caused by unequal heat capacity of the land and the sea. We know, you know, during the day, um, the sun is really strong. It's going to make the pavement really hot. Um, at night, the sun goes away, the pavement gets cold. If this is water, though, it's not necessarily going to, just because it's 80 degrees outside, it means it's going to make the water 80 degrees. Water has a high heat capacity. It takes a while for it to change its temperature, whether increasing or decreasing. Air and land do not have high heat capacities, and air is even less. So it's able to be warmed up much faster than, um, than your water is. So in the summer months, um, summer for us, it's so like May through August, the land heats up a lot faster than the ocean, right, because land is a um, low heat capacity. Ocean has a high heat capacity, which means its capacity to hold its temperature is high. It holds the temperature well. So we have the land that's getting really warm, and we know that not necessarily the land, but the air over it, not the, not the ground. We're not talking about the ground in, in marine science. We're talking about the, the land. That, the, <laughs> oh, we're talking about the, the gas, the air, the atmosphere. So that's going to get so much warmer than our water is. Well, if that, war if that gets warm, all that gas gets warm, warm things become less dense, and they rise. And now again, we have this pocket of emptiness. So what comes in is going to be air off, um, air in, in evaporation, you know, all those gas particles off the ocean coming in to take that. Um, but that's a lot of, a lot of rain particles coming in. It's going to condense and then it's going to precipitate over them. And that's, that's good for them at that period. Um, so if I'm reading just from the slides, then it's going to heat up the air much faster than the ocean. The air is going to rise because it's less dense. And when I say create a vacuum, like an area of empty space, there's nothing there. So things get sucked in towards it. Um, and it's going to be that warm, moist air over the ocean. 80% um, of water from India is from these monsoons. Um, so it's going to really help their cotton and their rice yields. Rice needs like really wet, really damp conditions to grow. Watch a time lapse video. Um, and then another decent monsoon video. You got a couple. So in the winter, it's different. The ocean now has been heated throughout the entire summer, and it's going to hold now that heat really well. Well, it's gotten pretty cold in that winter area. So the land does not, the air does not hold its heat very well, and so the air is going to get cooler. Um, whereas over the ocean, it's held its heat really well. That air is warm. Well, that warm air over the ocean is going to rise. And the cooler air in India now, like over the continent, is going to rush in and, um, you know, um, move over. Like, you know, moves from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So it's going to move and fill that gap. Um, so cool, dense air from the land now is going to blow towards the sea. And it's going to fill that, like, empty air void. That's There's nothing there anymore. Um, and it's going to cause, like, these post-monsoon, um, like, winds over in Asia. And rainstorms will occur over the ocean, and instead it's going to cause a drought in Asia. In class, we're going to draw this out. So I know this is, like, confusing hearing me talk it out. Um, I think things are better illustrated. You know I do that. Um, so I'm actually going to draw this out with you in class. Um, El Nino as well, I'm going to draw these out with you in class. So, like, a normal El Nino year, and then whenever we have, like, the actual El Nino conditions, when we have it oscillate, when we have it change, we'll draw this out in class, we'll draw the monsoons in class, it'll be much easier. 
I know these are a little foreign to us because we don't live in that area of the world. Okay, tropical cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons. Oh my, I believe I only have two slides, three slides left. Okay, um, so if we're in the Indian or uh, South Pacific Ocean, you can see this picture here. I would, um, you know, kind of sketch this out really quick. We're gonna call them tropical cyclones. Tropical cyclones are large, widespread storm systems. They have low pressure, strong winds, and heavy rain. Okay, and they're, they're also, they're gonna have to have like, um, they talk about temperature in here? No, um, we're gonna need to know that specific temperature as well. Okay, so when they ask the definition of this, you're gonna say that, or what kind of um, characteristics do you have in a tropical cyclone? Excuse me, low pressure, strong winds, heavy rain, and then this temperature, 79.9 degrees Fahrenheit or 26 and a half degrees Celsius. Commit that to memory, 26 and a half degrees Celsius, 26 and a half degrees Celsius. The other temperature that you needed to know was the temperature conditions for um, coral reef growth. Um, great. Um, know the wind speed as well. It needs to be, in order to be characterized as a tropical cyclone, it has to be greater than 120 kilometers an hour. Um, let me just convert that for you real quick. I believe it's about 65. 74. So 74 miles an hour. Okay. Um, in North America or the Northeast Pacific, we call them hurricanes. In the Northwest Pacific, you call them typhoons. So north above the equator and then west, typhoons. Uh, all these are tropical cyclones. Tropical cyclone, hurricane, hurricane. Okay, hurricane formation. Click this link. This is a link right here. Please click it. See YouTube video. Please watch it. Um, so all these storms are going to form under the same conditions, tropical cyclones, again, whether they are a hurricane, typhoon, or they're a tropical cyclone. Um, the air must be 26 and a half degrees Celsius. Write that down five times. Write that down 10 times if you can't remember it. As the warm air, um, as the air gets warmer, its density is going to go down because warm things are less dense. It's going to rise and it's going to take evaporated water with it. This rising air creates this low pressure area because you're removing gas, removing gas, removing gas. This area is like almost like empty, like we're losing all of our things. Gas will come take it. But anyways, this um, rising air creates this area of low pressure and it's called the eye. Um, there has been questions on previous tests that say describe characteristics of the eye of a hurricane. So it's going to have the highest area of low pressure, um, but it's also going to be calm. You don't have spinning happening in the eye of the hurricane. Spinning is occurring around it. The air is um, the air also warms and rises and creates winds while doing so because it's you know moving hot air up, but cold air is coming to take in. And then again, we have the spinning of the earth. Once again, or once it rises, the water vapor and the warm air will condense and release stored energy in the form of heat, latent heat, latent heat. This is not always easy to um, kind of differentiate between. Its definition is the quantity, so it's an amount, of heat lost or gained per unit of mass as a substance undergoes a change of state, vapor to liquid. So we know that um, energy can't be created or destroyed, just transformed. So when we are in this area of, um, you know, on the top of our surface waters, we're in a liquid state. Things get really warm. Okay, they take in energy and they go to this gaseous state. And they have more energy. Gases have more energy. They're going to rise, get cooler, and condense. Well, all this extra energy that they have in them because they went to a gaseous state has to go somewhere. Energy can't be created and it can't be destroyed, just transformed. So up here where we're condensing our air, this extra energy comes out in the form of thermal energy. How convenient. So now it's making this really warm um, hurricane and really warm weather situation warmer. Um, once it goes from its gas back down to its um, its uh, liquid state, it's going to lose energy doing that. And um, it's called latent heat. The word latent means hidden. It definitely is hidden because we don't see this happening, but it's, it's continually making something warm, warmer. Um, when we move the hurricane onto land, of course, we're not going to have all this evaporation and then warm air moving, condensing and coming down. So it starts to really lose its energy. And if it doesn't have that extra temperature component in it from that latent heat releasing its extra energy, then that hurricane starts to die down. We see that happening over land. Um, again, this heat warms even greater amounts of the air. 
moving that out of the way. It's going to cause even higher evaporation then and um, even a higher temperature difference causing more winds to come towards the storm. So the warmer the hurricane is, the, the worse the storm is going to be. So again, we're, we're making it warmer and which is less dense. Things move from an area of high concentration to low concentration. Same thing with winds from area that's cold to area that's warm. Um, and it's just going to happen more frequently that it's warmer. Please know that temperature. Tropical cyclone clouds will spin because of the Coriolis effect. So the spinning of the earth, which deflects things towards the right at a 45 degree angle in the northern hemisphere, and then deflects other things towards the left at a 45 degree angle in the southern hemisphere. Um, currents that start these storms also push storms in certain directions. So if I go back to these um, big uh, global currents, um, we have trade winds. You don't, Actually, this is going to be your water currents. It's not air currents. I'm not going to do that. But there's trade winds that blow across our equator. Um, so conveniently enough, this is why, uh, and they blow from, like, for example, Africa towards America. Um, this is why all of our hurricanes are going to start off the coast or the Horn of Africa and come towards us because that's the way the global wind pattern is taking it. Um, community impacts. We're going to have wind damage, shore erosion. Um, storm surge could definitely bring in heavy rains and cause flooding. Um, you could have toxins being carried back out to sea, but that's not really a coastal community impact. Um, pros, we're going to have increased rain for places that experience drought. Um, storm surges could carry nutrients, so that could help your aquatic plants develop. And if you're a fishing community, that's going to be helpful because you want you know, your fish are going to be feeding off your aquatic plants. So productivity will increase. Cons, loss of shoreline, loss of life, loss of coral reefs, erosion. If we lose our coral reefs, then our um, wave energy is going to be more. We're going to have a bigger impact. You don't have like that barrier to slow down wave speed and wave energy. Okay, guys, um, we're going to hammer this out next week. I'm planning for a test on Thursday, which is going to be the last day of my 30th year. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.